We're on. All right, good morning and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. This morning we are going to be taking up H687. We're going to start with our regional planning commissions. Welcome back, Charlie Baker. Good morning again. Uh, Charlie Baker uh, from the Vermont Association of Planning and Development Agencies. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, during the day, some days, uh, work at the Chinook County Regional Planning Commission uh, when I'm not here. Um, and uh, Catherine Dimitrik also uh, you know, looked at this testimony when the, she is unfortunately sick and um, unable to be here, but uh, I guess on the good side, she's not spreading anything either. Um, so, um, sorry, Catherine, she may be plugged in. Um, and uh, so uh, first I want to just share a word doc uh, and uh, apologies, Will, I will get all this to you as quickly as I can in a PDF so it can be posted. Um, just a, a few basic comments. One, first of all, to thank you for all the work that you're doing to address housing, environmental protection, and also uh, strengthening our planning and permitting processes to better support implementation of municipal and regional plans. Uh, that is really our most important point. <laughs> That's a big thing. Is this the same document you shared with me? Yes. Because I could then share it with Will. He could make it a PDF. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll just forward that. And then the other two were are the same? Um, this... And this one actually, um, well, I might have a little edit to this. Okay, we'll hold that. Okay. Yeah. Um, the first thing is uh, just, we uh, have previously provided some language about updating the relevant regional planning sections of statute. Um, but here's just a little outline of what we're hoping can be updated, updating the planning goals, the duties of regional planning commissions, the purposes of the regional plan, the process for regional plan adoption, you know, having the uh, ERB be the uh, approving entity, uh, and then the updating the elements, which is really that meaty section of the future land use pieces that we talked about. Um, so, uh, and we have some slight edits. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, taking a quick look at that, and uh, we will get that with the track changes that you asked for. Thank you. So I'll follow up with that. The second this is the meaty part um, and we really wanted to kind of follow up i think from our discussion last week on kind of getting more detail on tier three um and so this is I'm presenting just information to the committee without any position like we don't have a stance at this point anyway but just to give you information i was really hoping to have this on a interactive website so that you could play around with a, a lot of different layers and just kind of see where they are um, they all have obviously different implications for the environment. You know, they're, we have, and you're, you're probably much more familiar than I am, even with all of the, the uh, mapping that ANR has done over the years of all kinds of different resources and you know, the ANR Atlas, the BioFinder, the conservation design work. There's a lot of mapping that has been done of environmental resources in the state. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you like three slices at it. Um, in, in A here, I'm just gonna talk through this and then I'm gonna show you maps uh, after. This is the A here is the known constraints that um, were developed with ANR, the Department of Public Service when we were doing our uh, regional energy plans. Uh, I think it was back maybe 2017 or so. Um, and here are the, the seven or eight things, however you look at it, the vernal pools, uh, river corridors, Game of floodways. I note that that's floodways, not floodplains. State significant natural communities, rare, threatened, and endangered species, national wilderness area, and then class one and class two wetlands. And then they left open this uh, category eight, which uh, allowed us to um, work with our municipalities to see if there were any other like municipally protected resources that we should recognize in our mapping. Um, the reason I left that one on there, because uh, it may not be directly relevant to what, but is um, that the guidance that we were given, and I, I think I've mentioned this in previous testimony, was that um, that the land use policies in the middle of this paragraph applicable to other forms of development in this area must be similarly restricted. So uh, policies must prohibit all permanent development. Um, and so, and um, my region may be the only region that where we really did this because our towns have more um, restrictive zoning in some of their uh, resource areas. Um, and so 
anyway, I just, uh, it's, it's important. I know for my region that we at least have this option. Like if we have some to support what municipalities have done. Um, so that's, <clears throat> that's category A here. Um, a preview question. Yeah. Well, can, I, I have a question. Um, uh, so these maps are done in all of our regions. Yep. And uh, how are they currently kind of supporting our town's local planning? Um, they are um, used during the PUC process, right? Uh, as renewable energy projects come through. So there's kind of just a check of, is that project consistent with our plans? Uh, and so um, yeah, to my knowledge, I haven't, I'm not aware of any projects yet that have run into any issues. I think the developers of those projects are aware of these maps and you know, kind of staying out of those zones because, um, and, and you look at those zones, I mean, you kind of hope that they wouldn't be in the wetlands and the river corridors and things like that, right? Um, this was, uh, and actually maybe I can, maybe while I'm doing this, I don't know how good I'm going to be flipping back and forth. Um, this is what the known constraints, there was also a layer of possible constraints, but because um, they're a little softer than tier three, I'm not uh, showing you those, but this is what it looks like. It's 18% um, of the state. Um, and you can oh, see, see this. not showing. Oh. Let me stop share and figure out how to do that. Well, let me go back to my doc. I'll come back to the maps. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have the uh, eye in the back of my head. Um, the second category um, was just the highest priority interior forest blocks and highest priority connectivity blocks. Uh, so, um, and obviously uh, I think there's language in your bill now about making this a criterion in Act 250. Uh, that's certainly one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to make them jurisdictional through tier three. Um, so it's just going to show you what those layers look like. Um, and then there is, um, I think on section 23 of the draft bill, this critical resource area. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping we understood uh, what resources that, that definition is trying to protect river corridors, significant wetlands as defined in a, another section, land at or above 2000 feet elevation, slopes uh, greater than 15% and shallow depth to bad rock. Uh, we just mapped the slopes um, and not sure there may be some more detail we need to understand about soil types uh, related to depth to bedrock because uh, there, there was a modifier there. Uh, prime ag soils and then connecting habitat. Um, that one also we made we may have made a very large assumption or, or not. I'm not sure, but we mapped the priority and highest priority interior force blocks and connectivity blocks. Um, to kind of get at that whole habitat, connecting habitat layer. And I don't know if that was the intent or not, but. Did you do it? You did it for the whole state. Just, yeah, statewide. Just to give us a sense of. So yeah, 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 just wanted to kind of give you a sense. Um, all right, now let me stop sharing this if I can and try to share the PDFs. Thank you for letting me know that wasn't showing. Is that better? <clears throat> it's a minute. No. All right. Um, so sorry, this is this is the first map I was talking about. This is the known constraints that are in our energy plans. Um, and these are in the way the state was uh, labeling it, kind of the no-go zones. And you can see there's some big circles in the kingdom. There's a very large circle of, of rare endangered species um, where uh, ANR just kind of does a circle. They don't tell you exactly where that species is, right? So if you get in the circle, there's got to be some more analysis to understand where it is, and ANR needs to look at it more closely. Um, so, sorry, I'm scrolling fast. Let me know if you want me to stop, but just that's what it looks like. Um, we have a question from Representative Sabila. Just a, a yes. quick question. I apologize, Madam Chair, for stepping in a few minutes late and not seeing Charlie's presentation in my email. I don't think we have. I have not sent it yet. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. It's, um, there's. There's a lot going on in multiple committees, um, multiple times. So we are uh, working our best to keep up. We'll get it to you as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. um, map two, um, this adds uh, elevation. So uh, this is the current jurisdictional uh, above 2,500 feet elevation, just to get you a sense of uh, 
you know that which adds, color is that the the elevation is the additional is that orange, orange. Yeah. so it just adds a little bit so you can kind of tell a lot of those um the areas that were in the known constraints were pretty similar actually to that high elevation uh uh, except when we get down to uh, Bennington County and the Green Mountain National Forest. Um, this one uh, adds in the highest priority uh, interior forest blocks um, to the to the previous two. Uh, you can see the interior forest blocks start to cover a lot more of our upland forest uh, area. And I've got a spreadsheet with uh, data around this. Um, and then this adds in the connectivity blocks, um, and that adds, hard, it's hard to see the difference here. I guess, sorry, it's the same color. Oh, no, it's not. This um, lighter, I don't know what shade of green that is, but um, the that's Kelly, a different shade of green. The Kelly versus a little more tealy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that was much better. Um, but But it only adds in a few, you know, a few large blocks, some areas, you know, more significant impact than others. Um, and then here is, um, here's just a sense of which of those maps have, um, are already have some level of protection. So that means they're either in like a state forest, national forest, uh, there's some easement that there's a public, uh, easement available on. Um, and so you can get a sense of those lands that have been, you know, I think, uh, Anna uses that word protected, but there's a whole, uh, list of kinds of uh, ownership interests I'll, I'll say that the state has um, or maybe it may be a land trust or somebody else has in those properties uh, you can see the huge swath there in the uh, the national forest down in bennington uh, representative smith thank you <laughs> charlie uh, the purple areas are those areas the ones that are <clears throat> mostly uh oh, protected those are the ones that limited access, that sort of thing. Yeah, there are, I'm sure there are all kinds of different flavor restrictions on them, but there's some sort of public interest ownership or uh, so it may be it may be an easement or it may be outright ownership by the state. Do you know if there are any plans to tighten restrictions on Sledic or uh, Conte? No idea. That's definitely an AR question. But and they definitely don't ask us for um we will have these maps mm -hmm. yeah i will we'll get you there i may get you a couple more sorry as i said my uh gis person was up late uh working on this um thank you and i will also share if i can get back to the share screen uh, just one would be great um, we did try to produce some tables. Yeah, have a question. Just a quick question. We'll back, you don't have to go back to it, but on that map, mm -hmm. the purple, that, does, that includes land trust lands? I think so. It's, okay. um, so you land know, trust yeah. plus public. It looked like it's yeah. a okay. lot of easements okay. out yeah. in okay. the farmland. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, sorry, I'm calling it some sort of public interest because typically there's been some money that's flowed to the land trusts that help them buy an easement, right? Okay. That's fine. Uh, so, um, there's a lot of data on here. I'll apologize for that at the front end. Um, but we tried to just give some basic, uh, numbers to start here. Oops, sorry. I should start up here. That, that known constraint area, the one that we've been using in our energy plans, uh, is a, over a million acres. The state is about 6 million acres. Uh, so it's about 18% uh, of our land area. Um, and then you can see, you know, as you add in more resources, the percent of the state goes up. Representative Sibelia. Charlie, I am so appreciative of you bringing all of this really rich data to us. And I'm, I'm a little frustrated because I can't see it. Yeah. And, I, would, I think and I don't have the presentations. Um, Did this change? I'm sorry. Yeah. We were working on it at 11 o'clock last night. And yeah, so I'll get it to you as soon as we can. Well, like, let's, let's call this like our first level of understanding yeah. and then we'll have them back in and we'll have it. Yeah. And just to be clear, like this is not our data, right? This is state A&R data. We're just pulling information from uh, their websites. So, um, you know, without looking at the presentation or kind of looking more closely at the maps, um, one of the questions that I have is um, if we basically have already done this, if it's not really a big deal, what we're doing, why, 
are we proposing to do it? Why are we proposing these maps, the new maps? Um, we've only done number one known constraint areas as part of our energy mapping. That's that's the one that has some regulatory weight. Um, and I think the question is uh, exactly, um, there is, sorry, I, there's more in the bill that goes further than what we've already done, potentially. Um, and so we're just trying to get more clarity about what you actually want mapped. Uh, and, and I think most importantly, as you're talking about it, what, what ends up being jurisdictional. Um, so that has not been done. The maps, I mean, there are maps out there, but the policy decision about what's jurisdictional for Act 50 is my understanding what you're de debating. Yeah, well, so there's kind of two concepts here. So we have the, the bill, which is, you know, focused on conservation. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's a number of areas that haven't been mapped there in terms of tier three, uh, potentially yeah. being tier three. Right. Um, but just mapping in general, land use mapping in general, which, you know, we keep having all, of, you know, that we've already done most of it. And uh, the three groups, um, I think, the RPCs, VAPTA, came in with a presentation on the tiers, right? It was VAPTA, not the... Uh, that's uh, from the NRB. The NRB the came tiers are, yeah. Okay. And we have, you know, we had the, the nine future land use categories right. uh, trying to line up with those tiers, yep. So when we think about these things coming together, I, you know, I'm just trying to um, trying to understand what's the difference between now uh, and what is being proposed in terms of those maps and the categories. Like, why, why would we do it? What is the problem that Vermonters want us to solve that that solves? And I think that is a subject that you're all debating and it is kind of what- It's the, I'm talking about the studies that have come in. So VAPTA- Yeah, and I think- That you all have testified kind of fit together. So yeah. what is the problem Vermonters want us to solve that those maps, those studies are attempting to solve? I think it really is, um, and I think you maybe got some testimony from John Adams uh, maybe a week or so ago about where where is housing happening, um, and it's uh, you know we're st there's still a lot that's happening in fragmenting our resource areas, so I think that's kind of I don't know I'm I'm not the best environmental uh, advocate maybe, but I think the the forced fragmentation and the the impacts on our natural environment are probably on the one side. And then are we doing enough to encourage smart growth housing development on the other side? So it's really those, that balancing act of the environment versus you know, where, where are the people and the flora fa fauna. So I understand what the, you know, the kind of concepts of what this will do, but I'm, I'm trying to match it with the on the ground problems and challenges that my communities are experiencing and that help that they're asking for. Can, I'm going to, can I take a stab at this? Yes. Sure. I introduced the bill. Um, I'm going to say for me, the simplest thing is what is the role of land use and climate resiliency? That is what we're exploring. Yeah. And I, and I think my question is also the, about studies and the three things that have come together mm -hmm. around mapping and all of that. So um, I appreciate that. I share that concern. My communities are certainly asking for help. They are overwhelmed with what is happening in terms of water uh, and their size and their ability, uh, even with our RPC. So I also invert the question a little bit and just say, have the known constraints maps, how would just the existing requirements to map known constraints, how will they inform the future land use maps or how, how have they informed the existing future land use maps? Yeah, so I, in general, they're part of the natural resources that we identify. So, you know, over the years, there's been a lot of requests for us to identify different natural resources. You know, forest areas is probably the most recent addition, um, absent the energy work. Um, so we've been identifying those. And then there's um, been this, uh, I think, is it Act 171 maybe, uh, that added like looking at forestry specifically to regional town plans. And I think the question is, or one of the questions, because I think there's numerous problems that are trying to be solved here, you know, climate uh, change, uh, water quality, uh, housing, environmental protection, um, is can the state's regulatory system better support the planning that we're being asked to do? 
Yes. If I boiled it down to that. The state regulatory system, excuse me, Madam Chair, can I just grasp, grasp what this concept? Can the state regulatory system better support what we're trying to do? Is that what you said? So who's we and what are we trying to do? Towns and regions, I, let's just talk about forestry, for example. So the, in Act 171, and again, I'm not probably the best expert on this, but generally ask towns and regions to better plan to protect forest resources. So that's fine. We have it in our plans, but the like Act 250 and the state regulatory system doesn't help support that. And so then there's this kind of um, weird tension of like, well, why aren't the towns better protecting those forests? And this is really a statewide issue. It's really hard to regulate our forests. You saw the maps. They, they didn't stop at any town boundaries, right? Like they extend along the ridge lines and everything. So I think it's really how to better align the system. That's really what we're talking about, uh, particularly from the RPC side, to better accomplish the, with those articulated eight uh, state objectives of protecting the forest areas. How do we do that? Just one more comment, if I might, Madam Chair. So I'm really struggling, Charlie, and others that are listening. I'm really struggling to connect this to the problems that my communities are experiencing on the ground. And they are having a lot of trouble right now with the amount of staffing that they have, with their ability to plan, with the costs for adapting, with the watersheds, uh, their ability to negotiate with other towns. Our RPC has challenges with quorums. Um, we know that they're not staffed. They don't have any staff. So those are things that feel much more responsive. And so I may be missing the connection that is happening here, but I'm having a really hard time making that connection. And I want to. I really want to make that connection. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. And I do, I do think, I think it is important. I, I appreciate that point because this is not, yeah. This is our planning and regulatory system. This is not short-term fixes. Um, but I think in, what we're trying to do is get, uh, like, really look longer term. Like, are we going to do more to um, reduce erosion uh, coming from our uplands that, you know, end up in the little streams up at our mountains, getting into bigger streams and rivers where the flooding is happening as it goes downstream? So I think this is part of that equation because, the more fragmentation and driveways and erosion, the more the resources uh, are getting cut up, the more we're contributing to the, the problems that go downhill uh, and into our, uh, the places that are getting impacted. So this is long-term trying to prevent things from getting worse. Um, it feels, I, I apologize, Madam Chair, but it, it feels, that feels really important long-term. But in the short term, like just adding more regulation or tighter regulations on land use without a whole suite of um, other supports, public outreach, someone explaining to our communities what we're trying to do here, um, infrastructure, funding for projects, all of these things, you know. So just adding the regulation on top is actually not going to be helpful to my communities, it's just going to make things harder and feel more overwhelming. Yeah, and I think part of what um, the package of things we were talking about was a balancing act, right? More regulation here and less over here to encourage, you know, more of the things you want uh, investment in those places to get more flood resilient. So I'm going to push back on that for just a second, Charlie. And, you know, I believe we have to think about all of Vermont. Yeah. We have to think about all of Vermont in this regulation. And there are lots of different places in Vermont and and. All of those places are important and the people that live in those places are important. Where you represent and the larger communities, we're looking for less exemption. Where I live, you know, this feels a little bit like setting rural Vermont in amber. And so what I'm struggling with is how do we make sure that my neighbor, whose family has lived there for 150 years, can remain and their kids can remain. I need to help connect and, and, and they can figure out how people can be safe with a changing climate. Representative Stevens. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I hear what you're saying, um, Representative Sebelia. I think for me, I, I keep reminding myself that your testimony this morning is not necessarily as Chittenden County RPC. Your, your testimony is 
you were asked as one of two people for the uh, Vermont planning VAPTA to sit on the uh, <laughs> one of the three reports. And so I, I just keep putting it into my context that that's where you, you were going. And where I was hearing you ask was, hey, policymakers, can you clarify tier three? Because it sounds like it sounds like we have existing energy related mapping where it says no go. But then your question was, hey, if you're going to make tier three bigger or what are you going to do? That's where I was hearing your testimony go mm -hmm. was sort of from the VAPTA group. Um, policymakers, what are you thinking for tier three? Yeah. And, Is that fair? Yeah. And really just try to per present some information. Um, yeah. And I, I wasn't uh, taking that personally. And I think that's why you've heard me testify uh, before Representative Sevilla about the, the importance of what's in tier one needing to be very inclusive of the whole state. Um, and I hope I said that more than once. Um, and about 1B in particular, um, you know, I think the notion in the committee work and really uh, Sabina could probably speak better to this than I can. Um, she was in uh, more of those meetings, but was there is this notion of wanting to make sure that it is inclusive of um, in, in helping all the, the whole state and uh, make our villages stronger. Because uh, we're seeing, yeah, we are seeing population loss. I mean, if you look at the numbers, the numbers are not great in the in the whole state, right? Um, you know, and I'm I'm not coming here talking about Chittenden County, but like, okay, yeah, the growth's happening there. Is that good for the whole state? Uh, a little bit, you know, but it's not helping those play, all of your regions, uh, all of your communities around the state. So, how do we get to a system that better helps uh, all communities um, it, it, as much as possible? I would just say, Charlie, I really appreciate the work that you've been doing here. And I do not mean that intentionally, but it's a prime. I mean, it's a good example. I mean, of where you live and where I live okay. and making and I see a tension that could really kind of develop here. Oh, um, the tension's there where now. Where I live. I love Chittenden County. Yeah, that's where my kids live. Um, but it, it's so close to Vermont. It's really. <laughs> I didn't say you did. I know, I know. I'm sorry. I say that every time I'm here. I really do appreciate all of your work on this. And no. it's, <clears throat> here, yeah. it's helpful. So No. Um, and um, I'm not going to go through this line by line, but we did kind of just try to look at uh, those different resources, uh, how much land was included, um, how much is uh, protected by uh, state or federal agencies, how much is protected by municipal here. You, you can see the breakdown by, uh, by private entities, um, and then they're aggregated together. We also did a little bit of comparison here about the number of 901 points and the percent of 901 points in the different layers that we did, just to give you some sense. So like, if you just looked at the highest priority forest blocks and activity blocks, that's 3% of 911 points. Yeah, actually, I'm gonna forward this so that members can have it. Yeah, and I so apologize. That was a help if I pull um, it up a little bit. I'm, I think I'm gonna, uh, um, Will can make it a PDF and... What's that? We're all pretty blind. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I just had my second cataract surgery, so uh, I'm ahead of you. Um, and then um, we took the 911 points because they contain residential and non-residential, right? You could have a, you know, a barn or something be a 911 point. So we just separated out the, the 911 point or the residential 911 points to give you a sense of that so by these areas. Hold for one minute and then I think you are doing what I'm going to ask you to do, but... I just have like, it's a little distracting because at the top it's table one to table seven, which it looks like some are hidden. You, and I'm, I'm actually showing the blown up one on my screen here. Yeah. The one I sent to you, I just hid some rows. Uh, the municipal state, uh, the breakout of um, the protected lands. You can unhide those rows if you want to see the whole thing. I see. So we'll remember to unhide those rows. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, this is, this is um, I'm already feeling guilty of how much uh, data I'm throwing. No, no, we, actually, we need this. We need it. We're glad you did it. And it's fun uh, to take the time. We did 10 little tables um, to make it so easy to digest, but just try, try to cut it in different ways. So this last one was getting at the what we understood might be uh, the definition of critical resource area that's in the bill. Um, and you can see there's a lot of pieces. Um, so we did kind of the, you know, the percentages and 
uh, you can see it, it adds up to a lot. So again, I'm not making any judgments at this point, just trying to provide you information for your considerations. Representative Sibelia. So does that say 86% of the critical resource area? That's a big jump from uh, the 50%. And this is what is in our bill. The critical resource this, area, I think that, that is- didn't have forest blocks and- Well, and that's what- We had um, just- there were, the, I mentioned in the, when I was looking at the word doc that the, it says habitat, habitat uh, connection. And, that, and that's what, we we'll probably need some more definition, I guess. To clarify that. Yeah, exactly. Not. Cause there's, you can see there's like, um, it rose 82 through 85, the, the forest and connectivity blocks, you know, like, are you only thinking about some of those or are you thinking about all of them? Exactly. We're not clear on that. Yeah. I just want to, I would say when you read this, it's the list will be what they put in there is what those numbers, you know, so it's the calculation of if we define forest or highest critical resource areas this way, right? that's what it would look like. Not that that's what is in our bill. Okay. Thank you. For the <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so yeah, some clarification would be, and that's really the purpose of our testimony this morning is trying to get more clarification. And I mean, we really do need the, the mapping support, and I'm grateful to you for sharing your GIS person and making them available to do this. And if they're watching, I'm grateful. She's excited to work on it. So uh, I, I appreciate that she was until 11 o'clock last night. On. Not sure she's appreciating that part because she couldn't get the <laughs> yeah. stupid thing to load up onto a web. We're, we're trying to get you a web map. Uh, where you can actually play with the layers yourself. That would be great. Um, the one thing it may not have um, full, like it may be the, the analytical part is kind of comparing that like to 901 points or or those protected lands. So um, if you do need some more analysis, uh, please let us know. And I see Catherine is there no. uh, now that I stopped screen sharing. So I don't know if she wants to add anything that I missed. Yeah, Ka um, Catherine, would you like to add anything? Um, Charlie, I think you did an excellent job. I did, if I um, could take a minute, I when I was there last time, I was asked if I could show what mm -hmm. the community of Richford might look like with the flood corridor shown. And so I did produce a map that showed that, and I can share my screen briefly if that makes sense to you. You also have it. It is posted in my testimony under my name, um, and it it demonstrates, I think, the questions about how this whole scheme would impact rural areas because Richford is a very rural community in our region. Great, thank you. And so to orient you a little bit, <clears throat> um, the red that you see on the map is Richford's current designated village. And the hash marks that you see are the river corridors, which include the floodplains and the foliar erosion hazard areas. And if you look at the map, you can see that the designated village is essentially entirely taken up by the river corridor. So if we are only going to concentrate our future growth in these designation areas, which has been somewhat of the, the current process, that doesn't really leave Richford any safe places to grow as a rural community. If we look at what the Regional Planning Commission report would recommend, this pink area here would be the village growth area, which we think mm -hmm. upon acceptance of our regional plans would get automatic 1B status, so that this would have a lower jurisdictional threshold in Act 250. Richford has really robust development regulations and they have water and sewer service. And this would really encourage growth in the pink areas and give Richford as a rural community a, a quicker pathway to developing housing in those pink areas, which would be great for the community and bring it outside, bring more development outside of the river corridor. So I just wanted to follow up and let you know, I did do that map and just give you an idea of why that could be beneficial for our rural communities, especially including those that have river quarters that run through their villages, which is most of our towns. <laughs> Thank you, that's very helpful. Oh, sorry, the wrong button there. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, just one last um, note. I think you also asked us to come back with some comments on timeline. Um, so 
Uh, I'm going to throw this out there. I, I wish I could tell you that this was a uh, negotiated settlement between like NRB and, and DHCD staff and us. It's not. This is just our perspective on <laughs> what we would like to see. We haven't had the opportunity yet to really sit down and, and hammer this out. And, and there are, I'm sure, implications. Um, you see my second sentence um, or in the second sentence here that we kind of note the NRB and DHCD may not be able to meet these deadlines depending upon staffing and how much is required to happen through rulemaking. So this is also, and that, that second part is an important assumption. We're assuming that the legislation has enough detail that we don't need a lot of rulemaking um, and that we could kind of get started on this work right away. Um, so this is, this is us getting started on this right away. July 1, we start talking and start having those community conversations uh, that need to happen. Uh, start working on the planning process, um, hoping that by next July, there would be guidance on the updated designation program from DHCD, uh, that the downtown board is ready, uh, is seated and ready to, re I'm sorry, not downtown board. Um, I should say, I apologize. This is the reason I haven't sent you the PDF. Not enough uh, reviews. This should be the environmental review board. Sorry. Um, that they're ready to, um, and not that we'll all be ready, but just that they're ready as soon as possible to review regional plans. Um, the uh, NRB has received the training um, <clears throat> and assuming whenever regional plans start to get approved, what in our theory, the tier 1B and three, th tier 3 are put in place, those jurisdictional decisions kind of tie to the regional plan approval. So when the regional plans approve, those jurisdictions change. Um, and that would happen as soon as, so as soon as that would be the start of regional plan approvals. And then um, uh, and then there would be a follow-up another six months later, the NRB is ready to approve the plan growth area designations that would allow those full exemptions in those areas. And then by six months after that, so we're kind of doing kind of a two year uh, push on getting regional plans done. All the regional plans will be done in two years. Um, that is probably as fast as this could go. Um, so if uh, you think about these dates as this is the most aggressive schedule, but I think we're also, uh, if this is passed, we wanna kind of get started with the conversations and get started with the work. Commander Smith, thanks Amelia. Thank you. Uh, once these plans are in place, will uh, natural resources go into each community uh, and have a public hearing with uh, with the uh, select boards or with the uh, planning commissions? The I, the RPCs will be doing those public meetings for sure. In each town, um, I, that's kind centrally of, or dependent on how the, the how they work it with the towns. I think that's very possible that we're having conversations in each town because this is a significant um, upping of the importance of our plans that don't exist now. These plans will probably affect what our town plan is in Derby, I would assume. Yeah, and vice versa, right? Uh, your plan is, your town plan is going to influence what's in our regional plan as well. Okay, because um, we have, we have a, uh, about a 300-acre town forest that, yeah. that we keep pretty good track of. And uh, we'd like to work with uh, natural resources to make sure that it's maintained correctly and things are done properly on it. But we also want to be able to control it. Yeah. So it's yeah. a balancing act, I think. I think the last time I was here, I was saying, you know, I, I would not be surprised if we each have 100 meetings. Uh, you know, so uh, I, I'd like to think I'm joking about that, but I don't think I am. Um, so, um, and I only say that because that that is more... Uh, engagement then I think happens around a typical regional plan uh, going backwards in time. Uh, but as the importance of this work, uh, if it if it grows to the extent we're talking about, it is important to have more of those conversations. Uh, so, Thank you. Yeah. I have one other question, if I may. Uh, I've been trying to figure out, and I've asked this question before, exactly who determines what and where a forest block is and how big is a forest block? Excellent questions for A&R. Uh, we're, we're, we're using their maps. We've been able to answer it either. Um, if they can't answer, I can't. And the <laughs> minimum size is 20 acres. And, okay. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. 
good to know. Thank you, Chair. Um, Representative Sibili, thanks. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Charlie, for this. Helpful to kind of see these things in, in line. Uh, so this is implementation of this bill. Yeah. It, At it, the most it, aggressive. It passed into law. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. And I mean, I would just say it? it feels way too fast to me. Um, and particularly when we think about the um, inequity that exists between the RPCs in terms of the number of towns that they own. So we know the kingdom has more than twice, in some cases, three times the number of towns that some of the other RPCs have. A four or five times. Problem that we need to correct um, here, right? I think. Um, and the other, I just, you know, informing municipalities. So I'm also thinking about the pa how, how the power is flowing in all of this. Again, back to my bottom-up place that I'm really happy about. Informing municipalities. It feels like what we're trying to do, but also that doesn't feel bottom-up. And so if and then if we're informing municipalities, my hope would be we're answering a problem that they asked us to solve, which I'm, as I said, having a hard time connecting. Hard to. Um, I'm sorry, that that uh, sentence isn't meant to be that's the full public engagement process. We're just like, hey, there's a new requirement in town. Uh, we're going to all have to work together collectively to do some work to address the new requirement. So it's informing them of the new law and that. So that's the information piece. The, the, after that is more conversational, two-way conversation in terms of developing the plan. Uh, so I guess there's an analogy here. We do this kind of all the time. Um, we did the Home Act last year. Yeah. How did planning regional planning commissions help support towns with that? Yeah. So, from um, and I don't know exactly how, but I, I expect I think most of, almost all of us had you know meetings with our towns or uh, town planners or town planning commissions. Uh, the zoning administrators just had to. Do the same thing and, and i think this happens anytime there's a change in state policy the same thing when we did the energy plan <laughs> okay there's a new requirement uh fyi do you have questions we have quite a bit of back and forth with um sorry i'm looking for dhcd because they they put out kind of a uh you know faq on s100 uh, and so we actually worked back and forth with them to try to uh, get questions answered that towns had mm -hmm. about that new law um and then we did uh, and then and then we kind of end up working individually because a lot of that was around municipal zoning, right? So then towns had to, um, and sometimes, or probably lots of times they were asking for RPC assistance in terms of reviewing their regulations, what sections do we need to update uh, and working with them and supporting them and going through that process. Um, so yeah, that's kind of our normal work. Um, that's happened numerous times uh, in my time here, whether Waller Quality Act or Municipal Roads General Permit, the energy planning, um, yeah, you know, maybe not every year, but you know, every two or three years, whether we need to or not, there's a a, a change <laughs> that needs to be addressed. Uh, and sometimes they have slower timelines. Um, and you know, we're. I think that's a good question of like, um, like we have this deadline of June 26. Maybe we should give some of the regions more time, um, and. The, I think the balancing act there is just <clears throat> having done community planning for a long time, there, there is a limit to uh, the length of time you can have a, the same conversation with the community, uh, using community in more than uh, the municipal sense. <laughs> like just like you kind of, you have the conversation and you know, once it goes on past a year and a half, two years, it kind of people like kind of lose interest, um, and uh, and you even start to get new people engaged that weren't involved, and you kind of repeat the conversation. So then it can go on for a very long time. Um, and so uh, anyway, it's just very typical. The reason that we're at kind of that two years, like eighteen to twenty four months, is kind of the typical time that these processes take. Uh, whether you're doing your town plan or your regional plan, that's that's uh, we're not different from any place around the country, just to, for those conversations. Thanks, good. 
Charlie, can you um, connect for me um, the last time that we proposed to um, uh, to uh, uh, impose new regulations on every single property in the state of Vermont um, in terms of use? Uh, that's, uh, that's 100 probably isn't a great example because it didn't necessarily go everywhere, right? It was more where we had water and sewer had more implications. Um, you know, I kind of go back to the either the Clean Water Act uh, of 2015 or the energy planning work, you know, which was done statewide uh, through the RPCs. Impacted every single property in the state. Um, now, there's uh, maybe not directly, uh, but clean water probably at least indirectly, right? I mean, a lot of municipal road projects and, you know, the up uh, the, and people here may remember better than I do, but there were a lot of things that changed through that um, in terms of ramping up uh, stormwater regulations and sewer regulations and things like that. So, uh, and there's more even, and farms, right? That was a big impact on farms. Actually, it goes way back to water and sewer. I mean, we regulate how you can manage your yeah, septic system. Your well, uh, statewide, every parcel. I guess my, my question is just trying to, I mean, I, I don't feel like this is your everyday kind of piece of legislation. I mean, I think this is really historic. Um, it will uh, impact every property in the state. Um, it has jurisdiction over every property in the state. Um, or, or has the ability to control. impact, yeah, the potential to impact every property owner and how they can use their property in the state. And uh, I'm not necessarily opposed to doing that, but it's not just a little thing. It's not just a little thing. It's a big thing. And I don't think that that is a, something that Vermonters are asking us to do uh, just in general. I think there are problems that they're trying to solve, and I'm not sure that we're connecting this. I agree with the chair of what the outcome could be here, but I don't think we're out talking to communities mm -hmm. saying, you know, we hear you. This is the problem. We hear, we understand we're trying to bring you tools. This is a tool. Senator Tory. Thank you. Um, this conversation is making me think about hazard mitigation plans mm -hmm. because I feel like we are having these conversations more than ever in our communities. So the timing is optimal. Um, and I, your timeline also seems wise because I heard at a conference that after a flood, um, you kind of lose momentum in two years. And so all these plans that and projects that towns are identifying to protect themselves um, kind of have to get booted up and, and written down um, sooner rather than later. And, and so these conversations that this bill um, and this knowledge and, and um, sharing that this bill is going to occasion just seems ideal to me to, to kind of build on the flood resilience thinking that that is just essential, right? Um, so I'm just curious how the regional plan and the hazard mitigation plan, how do they speak to each other? Um. Good question. Um, so they should, the hazard mitigation plan should inform the regional plan. Hazard mitigation plans are not required. Uh, so that is an optional thing for towns to do. Um, the, the state has an incentive in the ERAF, okay. right? So um, if they do it, they get a higher percentage of state uh, assistance in terms of doing FEMA match for uh, when, when the disaster does happen and they have uh, damage to fix. Um, so there's, it's a pretty good incentive. Uh, I think, you know, most of our towns that uh, are concerned about damage do hazard mitigation plans, it's town by town. Um, so it, those processes are good. You know, you identify those culverts and bridges and things uh, and, and homes, you know, like so that's where home buyouts originate, right? Like, oh, we should buy out those homes because they're just repetitive loss. You know, there's a whole process to go through with FEMA on that. Um, 
but the one thing they don't do very well is something else I think we've mentioned here before is really look at the whole watershed, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, there is a kind of a gap in the system of looking uh, at the watershed. And, you know, we know that, you know, some of the downstream towns really need something to happen upstream, often in a different municipality to maybe, you know, help get a, uh, open up a floodplain or, or something else. Um, that's the one that always comes to my mind to really help mitigate when the, when the rain's coming, help mitigate the flood downstream. So, um, so anyway, sorry, they, but they do inform the regional plans when they happen. Um, you know, uh, I think we've, in my region, we've been trying to do them uh, with all the towns together that still works, uh, that works fairly well, but it's um, not perfect either. And some of that just the FEMA rules around hazard mitigation planning. Um, it's really, and this is one of those uh, situations where the federal government is so used to dealing with county government in the rest of the country that it doesn't work great for New England. And so, um, you know, so we try to work with the, with it as best we can. That was a great point that Representative Tory just made around the hazard mitigation plans. And I actually ended up working on a lot of hazard mitigation, mitigation plans after Irene, yeah. because a lot of towns were caught without them. And we had, these were towns that had good river corridor plans. Um, the projects were identified, but in order to get that FEMA assistance, I thought at all, but maybe you're saying just they got a better match. But I, I think they had to have a hazard mitigation plan to be eligible. That may be true. That. And I guess this reminds me, so we're doing river quarter plans, hazard mitigation plans. Um, and you mentioned how they hazard mitigation plans might inform some of your planning work, but the river quarter plans have been done in all of our major watersheds and, and do identify specific projects. <clears throat> How are those getting integrated into the larger planning content? And My knowledge of those may not be as good, but I think you know, most of those are done for water quality purposes. So I think they've been more uh, informed mm -hmm. in the tactical basin plans, which are done at a watershed level, but have a, a very specific water quality focus. Um, so one of the things we've been asking about um, is, you know, whether those uh, sorry, this is we're, we're kind of off topic, what I thought, it would, but but just uh, pl plant a seed. One of the questions we've been kind of asking um, in Senate Natural Resources as, as they're considering the S213, which is the river corridor uh, floodplain bill thing that they're looking at, is whether the tactical basin planning process should be updated to add a piece to also look at uh, flooding in the watershed. And if there are things that maybe not only accomplish a water quality objective, but also accomplish a flood mitigation objective. Uh, My experience with river quarter planning was <clears throat> definitely included mitigation, flood More mitigation. More flood mitigation. Yeah, and I don't know, Madam Chair, my experience with that, I haven't seen that really no. kind of, and maybe there's, maybe there's some tightening of statutory language around that that might help bring those more into the forefront. So, sorry. That, was... that is important. No, this is really helpful. Further questions for Charlie? All right. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. For doing all that background work. Um, let's take a five-minute break.